Welcome. You have just entered the Botanist Lab. My name is Meredith, and I'm a programming librarian at the Cedar Rapids Public Library. I'm so glad you're joining us. I don't know if I could be more excited about this, to be perfectly honest. I mean, do you know how exciting plants are? They're incredible. It's absolutely true. And in the next four days or so, we are going to investigate not only plants, but what actually botany is and what botanists do. And you are going to basically become a botanist. It's true. So without further ado, let's talk about day one. Day one in the botanist lab is kind of big and kind of big ideas because we're starting out with the very basic of things. Science. I mean, science sounds kind of basic, right? I mean, most people probably understand that botany is a science, but what is science even? Do you have any ideas? It's kind of a big concept to think about. Let me show you this. So, botany is a branch of biology dealing with plant life. Does that make sense? Probably. Plant life. You know plants are living things, right? They're all around us. They help us live, in fact. Now, you can see at the bottom here, right? It says, the properties and life phenomena exhibited by a plant, a plant type, or a plant group. So, it's not only looking at maybe one particular piece of a plant, see my lily bud, right? But also, how plants live and work together and what they do, right? And what humans can manipulate them to do too. We'll get into that soon. Now, there's something really interesting I think about plants. This is Encyclopedia Britannica's visual diagram of living things, right? So you can see I circled the plant kingdom here. So there are lots of different kinds of plants. One you can see here, here's the plants. And you come up, there's non-vascular plants. Hmm. Like with, like vasculars are like veins, right? Water tubes and systems that go up and through the stems and all. Also, there are vascular plants, okay? And those are the ones that have like, the tubes that transport the water and the nutrients all up and down. Then you can see it splits again into seedless plants, like that's a fern. They don't have seeds that get dispersed. And then there are plants with seeds. Hang on, I'm moving. Right? And they are different kinds too. Their trees have a whole section to themselves. And then that, I think it looks like a purple cone flower, a cone flower of some sort, maybe. Flowers are different than trees, right? So there are all different ways to classify or categorize plants. And that's going to be important too. Now, let's talk about the science part. We already talked a little bit about science, but scientists use the scientific method. So you can see over here on this side, this is the definition of science, which is a department of systemized knowledge as an object of study. Right, then you push up your glasses. So I think what's interesting is it's systemized. It's a system. You, when you think about science, you have a way of doing things. It's like a pattern that you follow each time. It's a plan. So that plan is called the scientific method. Do, 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 do. So the definition of the scientific method is principles and procedures for the systematic, that word is there again, systematic, systemized, principles and procedures for the systematic pursuit of knowledge involving the recognition and formulation of a problem, the collection of data through observation and experiment, and the formulation and testing of hypotheses. So what that means is that the system is finding a problem and asking a question about it using observation to collect data and through an experiment, see what happens in your experiment. And then all these guesses that you've made, see how your data, your observations line up to see if your guess was right or wrong. The brilliant thing about the scientific method is that even if your best first guess at what something looks like is wrong, the experiment is not lost because you disproved your hypothesis. 
if you prove it, oh yeah, it worked out the way I thought. If it didn't work out the way you thought, you still have more information than you did before. And that is super, super important. Can't lose with the scientific method, people. No way. So check this out. Next. Do -do -do. This is what the scientific method looks like when you put it into place. So this is Olga explains. You one are going to ask a question as a scientist. You are two going to research your topic. Three, state your hypothesis. That is your best guess about what the answer to the problem is, the answer to the question. Then you do an experiment. Then as you're doing your experiment, you're making observations, you're taking measurements, paying very close attention to see what is happening. And then you're going to analyze your data, which means you're going to make these guesses. Or at this point, it's not a guess because you can see what's happened. You say, this is what happened during this experiment. And then you draw a conclusion. That's your answer. Was the hypothesis proven or not proven? No, it's pretty exciting. So we're going to use the scientific method to conduct an experiment that has to do with a plant. And so the science of plants is botany. We're going to do a scientific experiment regarding botany. That's true, that's true. So hang on, let's just take a little step back and look at this. Let me move myself again, pardon me. Okay, so there are so many different kinds of botanists and oftentimes they're using the scientific method every single day. You can be a biotechnologist, so you can work in a laboratory. You can be using electron microscopes to find the DNA in plants. You can be studying plants and seeing how maybe the scales or the tiny cells on top of the surface of petals layer to keep water off and slide around and then be using those different kinds of concepts to make, I don't know, like a nano, a very small layer of synthetic material to coat clothing so that water is repelled. It's crazy the things you can learn from plants. And if you are into technology, that might be something for you. You could also be a florist. Do you know how happy it makes people to get flowers? Do you know how happy it makes me to get flowers? But understanding how plants work transitions perfectly into using them artfully, right? Especially if you need to know how to keep them from wilting or how to transport them or what plants might work best together for the longest lasting bouquet. You gotta know about plants. You could also be a plant geneticist. Here in Iowa, there's lots of agriculture and lots and lots of plant geneticists that are trying to figure out the best way to either artificially or naturally combine different traits of plants, different characteristics, so that they are resistant to bugs, they are resistant to drought, things like that, to make healthy, sturdy, tough plants, and other things too. You could also be a field botanist. If you like exploring and being outdoors, this could be for you, where you're going out into the field, Literally, you could be going into a field and finding specimens and collecting information about them. Or you could also be doing things like we will, we will learn, be an extreme botanist where you go and you are actually pollinating plants that are rare and endangered with the hopes that they, the species continues. You could also be a naturalist. So if you've ever been to like Wiki Up Hill, or if you've been to any kind of natural site, like a state park or where they have an education center, there are people there that teach you about the natural world. And for instance, a wide open prairie, right? At Wiki Up Hill, they have the prairie grass there. Or if you go out to Indian Creek Nature Center, they have the butterfly exhibit outdoors there. You have to walk through the prairie grass and then they have all the trees. There are scientists, botanists that teach others about the natural world and in the environment and ecosystems that exist. So there are so many things you could do if you want to be a botanist. Now, let's see. I would like you to meet a scientist. Oh, 
a perfect segue. Campbell, would you like to meet a scientist with me? Mm -hmm. Maybe. Okay, so this, you just walked in on the botanist lab, okay? So for today. My grandpa's here. My dad is here? Mm -hmm. You're kidding me. Yeah. What's he doing? I don't know. That man's going to check it out. Oh, I love you so much, buddy. Mm, I love you so much. So this is Yanez Enriqueta Julieta Mexia. So she's not around anymore. She lived a very, very, very long time ago. She was born in 1870, and she actually died in 1938, well before any of us were around. But what I thought was so fascinating about her is that she's a Mexican-American botanist, but she didn't start studying botany. She didn't start collecting plants. She didn't start on her pathway to science until she was 51 years old. That's about 11 years older than I am even. It's never too late to start and try something. So in her career, even though she didn't start until she was 51, she discovered an entirely new genus of plants. So that's like a whole different kind of um I know what a genus is. What is it? It's like a selection of animal species like horses and zebras and donkeys in the same genus. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm so glad we have a special guest star. And guess what? What? I forgot the name, but I'm pretty sure it's something like genus Palatroma, pa Palatromus. No kidding. Well, that's fascinating. Well, that's very helpful. So it's like a category, right? Always me. You're never too old to start something new, right? And so, even though her career as a botanist started when she was 51, she still discovered an entire genus of plants, and so it's like a whole, family's not exactly the right word, but a whole category of plants, and she discovered over 500 species, so like 500 different kinds of plants. That is Incredible, 500 unique plants, amazing. So it just goes to show, you're never too old to start learning, right? That's true. Now, let's look in your bags. Inside your red backpack, you should have a little brown paper bag that says day one on it, right? Okay, go ahead, dump it out. What do you have in there? You should have a bunch of supplies. Now, let's see, did you get everything? What I think is gonna be one of the most important things is the little notebook, okay? So the notebook is your field guide that you're going to create. Now, sorry, let me move just a little here. In your field guide, for the first day, I want you to do me a favor. Put your name on the inside, so it's yours, and then I want you to start thinking and drawing and doodling, right? So, I did can see over here, a doodle of one of my favorite botanists, Dr. Pamela Isley. You may know her as Poison Ivy. Can you tell this is a Lego minifigure? I worked very hard on it, it's true. So go ahead and do some doodles. This picture down here below it, this is me as a botanist. So I would like you to draw yourself as a botanist too. Now, I think you can see here, I drew a shovel for digging things out of the ground. I do have dirt all over my face, which is usually how I end up every weekend anyway. And here I have a little sketch of a root system. So there's grass on top, a little rabbit nearby, and roots down below. Here in this little kit are tools. Depending on what kind of botanist you want to be, your tools could look very different. So over here, I dissected a lily where did I put it? A lily bud. This is my lily bud. It, it kind of faded a little, but you can kind of see it's the same. So in my field guide, what I did is I took a ruler and I measured the bud itself. I used this little safety pin to pick out the pieces, and then I put some pollen down. And you can see up here this toolkit. Or the kinds of things that botanists would use to dissect parts of plants. So you can draw pictures of that, especially on yourself as a botanist, and think about all the different things you could possibly use. You could use a microscope, you could use things as big as a shovel or a hand trowel, and 
the sky's kind of the limit. So start thinking about all the possibilities, if you will, and go ahead and sketch them in your, in your field guide. Now, you're also going to use your feed, field guide to do some observations and an experiment. So let me explain how that will work. First, I think it would be really cool if you just walk around and make some observations. Start practicing with your eyes, finding things around you and what you're paying attention to. Here, let me move just a little. So you should have a magnifying glass in your packet. But if you even go outside your front door, even if you don't have a great big backyard over here, I bet you can find some grass sticking up in between the sidewalk pieces. You can pull it out and take a look at that root system. If you can find another piece of grass and pull it out to see the root system, you can compare. You can compare how tall the tops are to how long the bottoms are. If you can find some leaves, there's so many different kinds of shapes. And when you look really closely, you can see all the veins that they have. And then you can draw those and see if any patterns occur. Also, if you have flowers nearby, you can dissect them, pick apart the petals, note the shape, how many there might be, and what lies in the middle there. What's kind of hidden? right? The flower petals attract pollinators, but also protect all of those really important parts that are the reproductive parts of plants, where the stamen and the pistil is, where the pollen is, where the seeds come from. So make some observations, do some sketches, and get your eyes ready to see what happens. You could even write notes like, um, not only how tall they are, but do they smell? You know, like marigolds, they don't smell awesome. I'm not gonna lie, but that's probably why bugs stay away from marigolds and we put them in our gardens. So there are lots of different things that you can observe. Then, you're going to do an experiment in, oh, hello special guest star. Hi. So, we're talking about the experiment part of botanist lab. Everybody should have a package of seeds in their okay. kit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And everyone should have two cups and a paper towel. So what you're going to do is you're going to create a control and a variable. When you do an experiment, it's important to have one thing that's kind of normal or constant. <coughs> that's your control. And then the variable is the thing that you change. You can't do an experiment with just one thing. Don't pick your nose, that's gross. Okay. Because you don't know, you don't have anything to compare it to, right? So for this experiment, you can see there's a yellow and a blue square down here. Blue. One of your cups of seeds is going to be your control. And you're going to put that perhaps, you know, on a table near a window, somewhere close to light. Um and put a little bit of water on it. Keep that little piece of paper towel damp, but not overly wet. You're gonna do that for both of them, but the yellow one, you'll put one near the sun, and as you can see under the variable, your variable is gonna be the other. For demonstration purposes, I just covered it right now with a container, but mine is right over there in the laundry room in a cupboard where it's dark. So your control, will be out in the ambient light, and your variable will be your seeds somewhere in the dark. And every day, check and see. Make sure that the paper towel is moist, damp, but not overly wet. You don't want your seeds to get all mildewy. But look and see as they start to germinate. Does one go faster than the other? Does one grow at all taller? Do the seeds start to split faster on one and the other? There are all sorts of different observations you can make. So a good question, here's the question. Does it matter if seeds are in the light or the dark to germinate or germinate well? Now here's something I was thinking, well, plants like being outdoors, so being in the light would probably work better. But if you think about it, plants actually have seeds that usually grow under the ground, right? The instructions on your seed packet say to plant under the ground. So 
Will they do better in the dark? Yeah, some do better in the dark, some do better in the light. Well, we're just going to have to wait and see. Won't we? Uh -huh. So every day, uh -huh. check and monitor and make sure your seeds aren't getting moldy and that they're nice and wet. But every day, you're going to want to look and see if one makes a difference or the other.